Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Paul Ryan. Welcome back. <clears throat> if you're joining us again after participating in some of the previous yeah. webinars, uh, and a warm welcome if you're joining us for the first time. Uh, I'm going to be the presenter and facilitator for this session, but I'm going to hand over to Ashley Rogers from the Goulburn Broken Catchment Management Authority just to yeah. welcome us all and acknowledgement of country. So over to you, Ash. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'd just like to welcome you all yeah. on behalf of the Golden Broken Catchment. Um, if I could just get everyone to mute themselves so I'll know myself talking back. <laughs> um, so we're really pleased to be working with Paul and the Australian Community Centre to bring you this webinar series. Um, we've been overwhelmed with the interest. We've had over 200 people register for the five sessions um, or a combination of them. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Golden Broken Catchment, the Tangarong and Yorta Yorta people, as well as the traditional owners of the lands from where you're all joining from today and their unique connection to country. I'd also like to acknowledge the Victorian Government, Our Catchments, Our Communities Program and the Golden Broken CMA for sponsoring this webinar series. Uh, you might be wondering why is the Golden Broken CMA interested in resilience? Um, we've been using resilience principles and thinking to guide our strategic planning and approach to natural resource management since 2005. Um, we'll be talking about it more in the next uh, webinar session, um, but at the moment we're renewing our the Golden Broken's re regional catchment strategy. So this six year strategy guides actions to improve and protect the catchment's natural resources. So that's the land, water, biodiversity, community, um, and looking after these precious resources, as you'd all understand, is in, underpins the social, cultural, and economic well-being of the catchment. So, um, resilience thinking underpins the strategy, as um, as Paul's been discussing in the previous webinars. Um, and for those that are just joining today, you can watch them um, on the Gone Broken CMA's website um, and catch up. But it's around that focus between people and let nature and helps you plan for uncertainty and change. So the strategy, um, which we'll cover next week, but it's not just for the CMA, but for all organisations and landholders involved in natural resource management. So we're really keen um, to work with everyone in the co-design and the renewal of the new strategy. Um, so we'll have some options um, for people to get more involved um, if they'd like. Um, we also strongly believe in um, helping support um, capacity build building um, of individuals, groups, organisations in the catchment to understand and apply resilience. So that's been another important driver for us supporting this um, webinar series. So that's all from me um, and I'll hand back to you, Paul. Thanks, Ash. Um, so this is the fourth session and in the previous three sessions, we've kind of been building a foundation, if you like, thinking about what are some of those underpinning ideas of resilience. Today, we're really going to just focus on practice. It's really about uh, how do we do this work in practice? And what I'll do is draw on, um, in particular, one main case study that, that we've used a lot and worked with a lot over the last few years. That case study is in New South Wales, the Gabang Community Resilience Network, and I'll draw on um, their work quite a lot, and I just want to acknowledge them. Fantastic bunch of people doing really amazing work for their community uh, and, and trying to address the sort of challenges that they have. Um, and then I'll just draw on some other work that we've been doing in other places around the world uh, and other little case studies, different places. That's the rubbish truck going past. You might hear in the background there. I'm out in the shed, so apologies for that. Um, so the Gabang Community Resilience Network, just as a quick introduction to, to that network. Um, so, oh, sorry, I should just mention, so we'll just work around this little loop and, and you know, the idea is if we work around this little loop that we um, can really arrive at some ideas around resilience thinking. We're drawing on these concepts that we've talked about over the last three weeks. And we're now moving into this kind of planning and action sort of space. And as Ash said, next week we'll talk about how the Goulburn Broken Catchment Management Authority is using resilience concepts in their um, regional catchment strategy renewal process. So the idea here is we work around this kind of loop. We, we as we go through that loop, we understand more about our system and we get to more towards planning and action. The 
Gabang Community Resilience Network that I just want to briefly introduce. It's a network, yeah, so Gabang is a, a, a region or, or a local district, if you like. It's actually centred on the town of Yeovil in central west New South Wales, so inland from Sydney. Yeovil is uh, quite a small place uh, that falls between sort of Dubbo and, uh, and Orange and Parks, if you like, in that space in the middle there. And uh, like a lot of small country towns, you know, right across rural Australia, it's it's struggling. This is sort of peak hour in, in the main drag of Yeovil. Um, and, you know, just going through all the challenges of small towns, loss of services, declining ageing population, lots of challenges in the town itself, but also in the surrounding landscape. And, and the community's had a really tough time over the last few years, like so many communities, um, extensive run of drought conditions, they've had uh, flooding, they've had some adjacent communities have suffered some really serious bushfires. Uh, they've had a uniquely a, a, a cattle a tick that came down from the tropics and they were quarantined for months on end. People couldn't sell or move stock around. They've had, uh, you know, some tragedies in the community, some people killed in, in car accidents and things like that. So a community that's really been very challenged and had a lot of difficult times. Uh, so people got together, driven by, uh, initiated by the lady in the blue there, Tracy Potts, a fantastic community leader who was the CEO of the Landcare group there at the time and is now works for uh, local land services up in that area. And she just had this vision of sort of bringing people together to, to help think about and understand resilience and see what they could do. So she got together this group and they're a really diverse bunch. There's people there from the local schools, so school teachers, there's people there, uh, farmers, there's people from some of the local agencies, from churches, from uh, the regional fire, uh, rural fire service. So just a diverse bunch of people, not necessarily the community leaders, uh, traditional leaders, they're, you know, they're not head of any organisations or anything like that, but an amazing bunch of people with very strong connections and a real uh, sense of community connection and empathy towards the community. And so fantastic bunch of people to have together to do this work. And we did a lot of the same things that we've gone through over the last three seminars here. We talked about different types of resilience. We talked about that stress curve and about trying to use resilience concepts to kind of lower that stress curve, if you like, in the, in the community. One of the first things we did with that group was I asked them to come along to the first session, the first morning of the first session together and to tell a story about resilience and what resilience means to them. And one of the one of the people that participating brought along this jar and he told a story about this jar and it was something that he'd recovered um, following a disaster in the area. And, and it became a really important symbol for that group. Uh, and it's been a really powerful kind of symbol for me too, working in resilience. And I'll come back to that story about that jar later on. So, as I said, we're going to move around through these, these boxes and we're just going to look at practice. And the first one is really about this developing a systems view. And the practice here is, the key idea here is about being able to visualise the elements and the relationships that make up the system. So, uh, why you, you need tools, you need approaches that help you to be able to bring that to life, to be able to visualise. And so, Here's an example from the Golden Breaking Catchment Management Authority's regional catchment strategy. This was done a few years ago. This idea of looking at the catchment, the catchment as a whole is, is obviously diverse. It ranges from the mountains down to the, um, the floodplains and irrigation country along the Murray and the Goulburn. And obviously that's too big a scale to visualise the system. And so they broke their system down into these six social ecological systems and for people joining us for the first time that's a bit of jargon it really means the connection between people and place so they broke it down into these six different social ecological systems and then they focused in on how those systems work and there's been various pieces of work in different areas across the catchment to understand uh, the the connection between people and place and how they work and here's a really simple little kind of rubric that we use, a simple, really simple tool. And this is a really powerful tool that you can use with your groups or your land care group or your community groups or whatever. And it's called the, the three L's. 
And it's really a, a simple way to do this is to, if you've got people working in groups, um, or you've got a community group together or people at, the ta at their tables or whatever, is to get one group to work on, on landscapes. So you're just asking them to think about what are and, desc and describe the landscapes. You're asking them to think about uh, another group to think about the lifestyle. So that's the social dynamic. So how is it organised? And trying to get people oh, to... Sorry, Paul, you might you have to spot your video for the presentation to you so we can see your whiteboard. <laughs> Good point. Sorry, I completely forgot about the key step there. Let's try that. Um, sorry about that. I knew there was something else I had to do. So you might want to get one group to talk about lifestyles, uh, one group to talk about landscape, and another group to talk about livelihoods. So, and all you're asking those those people to do is to describe for their area, what is it about that um, landscape that's important? So you might be talking about the topography, you might say there's rivers, there's floodplains, there's productive agricultural land here. Um, you might just be talking yeah. about in lifestyle, it's how is it socially organised? So what is it, how, you know, how do people, what's the size of the communities, how are they connected? What are the important social networks? And just get people to, to write those down, add them to their, come up and add them to the to the board. Uh, and then you can just start doing some really simple things with this and start asking, well, what's the connection between this and this? What's How is lifestyle related to the landscape? Well, you know, obviously there's connections about agriculture and there's connections about how people recreate and where they go and all of that kind of stuff. So this fairly quickly, you end up with uh, lots of relationships and things like that. And you can fairly quickly develop a systems diagram about your system and how it works. Um, that's not a lot of work, uh, can be done fairly quickly with people in groups, and then, but it, it's really rich and leads to lots of discussions. So a really simple little tool that can be used in practice for uh, understanding your landscapes and livelihoods, lifestyles, to get that system visualisation. In the Yeovil case in the, with the Gabang Community Resilience um, Group, they already had really good information about the, the biophysical system because they'd been mapping that stuff for years, but they had poor information, relatively poor information about the social system. So we spent more time mapping the social system and looking at the connections, looking at what groups and organisations there were, what social structures, how could we connect with those, how are they connected to those bigger centres outside the region. This is another example of visualising a system. This one is a uh, I'm um, done with with craft materials. It, it sort of looks pretty interesting, but this is uh, one that was in Angola on the Zambezi River, and and people got together, and you know all of these things represented all these bits of material represented different things, um, but they could visualise the system, and then we used that for three days to to talk about how to intervene in the system and what sort of changes were happening, etc. And and it, these things become incredibly powerful sort of artifacts. Uh, here's another one. This is a um, the supply chain of rhino horn being harvested up the top left-hand corner there, right down to the end user in Vietnam, uh, and all of the linkages in that, and and how you know rhino horn moves through the system, and who are the key players. Uh, here's another one. This is in Africa as well, with um, with uh, land managers from South African national parks and from private game reserves, and visualising the system of um, uh, conservation networks and and how again how poaching takes place in that system and each of the people in there are, are you know different elements in the system. Again, the key here is really about being able to visualise it because it leads to lots of discussions. And so, if you can visualise a system, keep in mind that systems are a construct. You know, they're not sort of real. They're something that we develop. They're something we think up. So. Everyone has a slightly different understanding of the system in their in their mind, in their own minds, and so it's really critical that you somehow visualise that so that people can can discuss and talk about the same types of things. And every time I do this, every single time, and I've done it hundreds of times, you just people discover and learn together about their system, and you have these conversations where people saying, "Oh, I didn't realise it works like that," or "You think it works like that?" Or, I think it works like this. That's what you really want to happen. So, visualising it's absolutely key. 
So literally getting out your markers and paper and drawing or getting it craft or string or anything that can help people to visualise the system. We then said we talk about system change and system change is really about trying to understand how the system has changed in the past and how it can change in the future. And from that, you can start to say, is that the sort of change that we want in the future? So you can start to talk about aspirations. One of the most powerful things you can do here is to look at the historical events that have taken place. And a really simple tool for that is an historical timeline. And so here's an example from the, the Gabang Community Resilience Network. They went to the local show and they set up a timeline and they just literally got people going past to come and map onto that timeline the most significant events they thought had shaped their community. Um, it's a really fun thing to do. Here's one in, in Africa, just putting together a timeline and it's, it's a, an enjoyable thing to do. You get lots of discussion. And in this case, we were getting people to add different the different colours on that on that board uh, represent um, social, environmental, economic, um, and technological kind of events that have happened in their community over time. And they could go back. You know, you can go back as far as you like, as long as the you've got the the knowledge in the room to go back as far as you like. And again, and really, this has become a really important document for people. We also want to talk about the future. How could the system change? And this is something we call futures. We was something we invented to think about scenarios and how trying to introduce more randomness into thinking about the future and look at the events, you know, um, over the last few months here in terms of thinking about bushfires that have happened in the northeast here and then thinking about COVID coming along, that combination most traditional scenario planning processes wouldn't um, throw up that combination. So what we did was come up with this futures wheel idea where we get people to think about all the things that could possibly happen in these different segments. Um, you know, social system, economic systems, governance system, ecological, technological system, what could happen in, over the next 20 years, for example. We get them to write those into those little segments. And then to introduce randomness, I literally get a handful of mints or you can use stones or anything and literally hold it above the, the future wheel and drop them. And where those stones land, you take that combination of events and put them together. That's one future. And you can do that two or three times to just get these unique combinations to get that randomness to, to help people think about the possible future that they might experience. And that's worked really well and it's and it's interesting to see the combinations of things that you get. None of them so far that I've seen have been as as interesting as you know the combination of things we've had in real life. So um, you might think it seems crazy to get that amount of randomness, but in fact it, it doesn't even come close to the randomness we have in the real world. And we, we can explore through these kind of futures approaches, different drivers and trends and how things are being driven in particular directions and why, and then these emerging trends. And another fantastic tool which was developed by the International Futures Forum is called Three Horizons. And I'll, I'll put some links to uh, these, some of these different tools. Um, we'll send those out with the PDF of this presentation. Three Horizons talks about different time horizons and how those different time horizons play out for us and and how moving between the time horizon that we currently experience, the, the current, the present, to some future horizon that we want to get to and, and the challenge of getting there and how do we sort of disrupt business as usual, those sort of things. It's a fantastic tool being developed over a long period of time by some really expert um, facilitators and process facilitators and, and future thinkers. Um, we we want to use this kind of idea of thinking about the future, of thinking about how the system can change, thinking about how it's changed in the past. We want to explore things like limits, tipping points and thresholds, how how the system can change suddenly in different directions, what limits are we reaching, and that can help us to guide what sort of actions we might want to put in place. So again, absolutely crucial to understand how the system has changed in the past and how it could change in the future, and that can help us to think about what's the future that we want. Again, another quick tool that we use that um, is, is really a, a simple tool, a really powerful tool. We've done it a lot uh, with colleagues in the, the Murray 
uh, catchment management authority area. Uh, they did most of their consultation for, for the development of one of their regional catchment strategies. It's called the ice cream diagram. And it's really simple, but again, a very easy to do, fairly quick thing to do with community groups. And it, and it starts with asking people about what are their aspirations for the future. And that's the ice cream, if you like, on the top of the diagram. Everyone loves ice cream and everyone wants the ice cream. And all, again, all we do is ask people to write down their aspirations and they can start to come up and put those aspirations up on a sticky note. And it doesn't really matter. We're not trying to get to a single future here. There's lots of potential flavours for the ice cream that we can have in the future. From there, we can ask people, what don't they want? And communities and individuals are really good at describing what they don't want. And so we we get them to, to identify what are the things that you don't want to see in your future and in your landscape and in your community. And we ask them to write those down and put them out on the sides. And soon you, you, we can put those on both sides, those things that they don't want. And so you can see the cone of the ice cream starting to form. So you end up with all these things on the outside that they don't want. And then you can really focus in on, so what what's in here in the cone that we can build on? What are the positive things that we can build on that can help us to um, you know, form the foundation for where we want to go towards our aspirations at the top. And you can take it further and start to talk about, well, what are the, the individual drivers? So these might be what are the kind of assets, if you like, or what are the things, the strengths of the community and the, the landscape that we can build on? And then you can talk about, well, what are the individual drivers that we might want to use to take us there? You can also start to talk about what are the tipping points? What are the things that might push us out of the zone where we want to go and push us out to this undesirable part. So what are the drivers that might be the negative drivers that are pushing us in the directions we don't want to go? And then what are these limits and tipping points here? And you can really hone in and start to talk about, well, how do we stay on the right side of the line where we want to be? What might force us to the other side of that line? And you can explore that. And that's another simple little kind of bit of work that you can do that's quite powerful in terms of thinking about system dynamics and how systems change. Um, and they're called state and transition models. And again, I'll, I'll put a link to those, but they're a really powerful, simple little tool to go deeper into understanding how your system can change uh, in, in ways that you might not want. So they're just a couple of simple little tools that are easy to do, um, generate a lot of information quickly, they're really engaging, they're fun, uh, and they can really help you to understand systems and how they work. The next kind of phase, if you like, is, is trying to think about, well, how are we going to respond to some of the unintended or unwanted kind of things that can impact on systems, the shocks, the crises, uh, those things that come out of the blue that impact on us. And <clears throat> the Gaban group, the, the community resilience group, they they decided that they wanted to understand more about the community's capacity, their community's capacity. So they literally set up a, a stall at the local show. They surveyed people. When they surveyed them, they gave them, everyone who did a survey got a, a, a go box, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But with the go box came a list of community numbers, a list of things you should put in the box, etc. So it was a way to draw in lots of people, um, do these surveys, and then um, they had a whole lot of information about the community and how prepared they were for different types of events. And the results were really fascinating. So when we you know, looked, they surveyed around 80 people, 80 um, families and, and individuals. Um, so when they asked people, do you know what disasters could affect your area? Most people are obviously really well aware of the things that could impact on the area. So this was for the landscape, but also same level of results for their household as well. They then asked people, um, how uh, have you planned with your household what you'd actually do in an emergency? Um, the majority of people hadn't planned what they do in an emergency. When they asked them, where would you find out information about emergency evacuation centres? Um, only three out of 10 people could actually say where the emergency evacuation centres were. They asked people about, do they have an emergency stay or go kit? And the vast majority of people, 93% of people didn't have a, a, um, a stay or go kit. So that helped them to focus in that community group on the um, 
focus of, that they would put on some of the work they would do with their community. So they develop these go boxes and they have them as little samples and they take these around to events and shows and, and talks that they do. They've got in there, you know, examples of things that you might want and critically things like the things that really help you get your life back to bed together quickly. So things like the uh, a digital backup of all of the key documents that you need, those, you know, important memory type items, things like photos and things scanned in and put onto uh, just onto a memory stick. But also things like a, an inverter to that you can run off your car that you can charge your laptop and your phone with. It's been shown that that's a really critical thing for helping people get organised, as well as, like I said, these key lists of key contacts in the community that covers everything from the emergency contacts, but through to things like domestic violence, animal health, all of those sort of other kinds of numbers, that, emergency numbers that you need when you're under could be under stress. Um, <clears throat> they asked some people to to send in how they were getting prepared for, for the summer and, and they got some really interesting contributions. I'm not exactly sure what disaster these people were preparing for, but it looks like they were going to have a bit of fun. But it's been a really good conversation starter for the community about, you know, how prepared are we for some of these events. Um, and then finally, this is a really curious little um, piece of information too that came out of the survey. How confident do you feel to provide help if someone called on you? People, 100% people, people said they were confident to provide help to family, friends and neighbours. But interestingly, when they were asked, do you have a, a network of family, friends and neighbours you would call on for help? You know, what, there's something like uh, one in 10 people didn't have, didn't feel that they had someone to call on. And so there's a, there's a mismatch there. There's a kind of, um, a, a disparity between people are willing to help, but then some people felt there was no one that they could call on to help. So that started a conversation or it contributed to these conversations about community vulnerability and who's vulnerable and who's not. And, and this community group went through something which I think is one of the best little processes I've seen from a community group thinking about resilience was they started to map the vulnerabilities in their community and they did this in a traditional way for a start. They looked at areas that were susceptible to flooding and um, areas that were black spots in terms of mobile phone coverage and areas that were um, uh, sheltered if you like or, or kind of um, uh, black spots for seeing um, smoke coming from dangerous bushfires and those sort of things and so the, the directions that bushfires came from. But then they started to ask questions about, well, so who in their landscape is vulnerable and why? And that led to a whole conversation about vulnerability in the community and different types of vulnerability and how people are vulnerable to different events. And that's been an incredibly powerful process. And the, the knowledge, they've gone around quietly and talked to people. They've identified people that are vulnerable. They've tried to make connections with those people. They've identified a whole bunch of people who don't have access to technology. Um, because they live in a black spot or because of their, their age or some other barrier that stops them accessing technology. So, you know, the assumption now is that people will get warnings via their phones and all of that sort of stuff. They identified the people in their community who don't have access to that technology for various reasons. And now they've worked out how they will contact and access those people when, when they need to. It's been an incredibly powerful process and, and it's meant that they've had to discuss all of those challenges about privacy, about what do you do with this information, how, who has access to it, who shares it, all of those sort of things. And, and that in itself has been a really amazing process to witness this group work through that uh, and to think about uh, this idea of vulnerability and, and understanding who's vulnerable. So again, a simple tool, but, but incredibly powerful process to work through. That also led them to think about community connections and, and this had been a little process that had been running in a small area for quite a while. They just call it beer and chips and so it's a one hour thing. It's on the roadside. It's not at anyone's house. It's not in any venue because, you know, all venues have legacies and have power. You know, some people won't go to the local church for whatever reason or they won't go to the community hall because of whatever. This is neutral territory that's just on a roadside. Uh, everyone comes, you've got to come in your work clothes. That's the the rule so that people keep their identity. They're not, you know, getting all spruced up to come along. They literally just turn up in, in what they're wearing, drop your tools or, your, you know, put your pen down or whatever you were doing, get in the car, drive down to this corner, 
um, in this case, just down on the corner of near someone's um, place, have a have a beer and, uh, over the back of the ute and and have a yak. And and there's been some really incredible feedback about the importance of this, particularly from a mental health perspective and strengthening that connection so that people do feel more connected. Really simple little process, but an incredibly powerful one. The, the Gabang group now, the Community Resilience Network group, have, have taken it up a notch. They weren't happy just with the little go boxes. They're now going to develop and they're in the process of purchasing three shipping containers that they're going to stock with what they think are the emergency needs for their community and they're going to strategically locate these in three places around the, the catchment and they've designed them to be uh, portable and flexible so they, the the idea is that if a community an adjacent community or a local government area nearby needed these things they're, they're designed to be able to slip onto a back of a truck uh, and you know their, their aim is to to be there when someone some community needs it is to have these three shipping containers full of emergency equipment that they can just bring and drop uh, to help support their community. They they feel very strongly that the community should be in charge and leading this kind of post recovery stuff when the emergency services have done their job or before the community, the emergency services can get there, that the community should be the one stepping in and playing this role. And so they're taking that role very seriously. It's an incredible process to witness. I'll just dip down into the, the principles here and, and um, we talked a lot about these principles in detail last week. This group, the, the Yeovil group, um, the Gaban group, worked through a process looking at these principles. So I you know, put up the eight principles. We talked about how those principles and things are associated with those principles are changing, what's causing that change in their community and what could they do to improve it. And what they did was come up with a a set of their own principles. So, so they reduced down those eight principles down to four about these are the, the ways they want to do this work, they, the way they want to work with their community. Um, interestingly, the bits in highlighted there in dark blue are links back to those original eight, the set of eight principles that we talked about. And so they actually pick up elements of at least six of those eight in what they put together here in, in their reduced set. but. So this is guiding their practice, it's guiding the way they work and, you know, it picks up things like that, as I said, about flexibility, you know, the shipping container idea, um, but also around things like learning and thinking about flow of resources, connections, those sorts of things. Uh, finally, just talking about coping strategies and, and what's the, we, we talked about this is it's not the psychological coping, it's about the strategy, how do we how do we go forward and and they've put together an action plan in their community so for this community resilience group it's a it's a simple little plan in in a lot of ways and it, it ticks off a lot of the things that you would do you know and they have been doing in terms of what i would consider sort of somewhere between this persistence and adaptation that's really about keeping the system running Interestingly, over the last few months, they've started to talk more about this kind of adaptation and thinking more about, well, we, we, want to, we don't just want to bounce back. We, we need to be thinking about taking opportunities. And so they've got a little simple plan here, but actually it's starting to move more towards how do we be more creative? How do we get more, um, uh, take more opportunities and those sorts of things and starting to focus more, I think, on the the more adaptation, creative adaptation, which is pushing them more towards more transformative sort of actions rather than where they started, which was much more around persistence and re what I call reinforcing adaptations, things that are really about keeping the current system running. So that's a, a quick snapshot. Oh, I should mention, by the way, that um, they won the uh, Re Resilience New South Wales Awards for their work and, and this work now has been expanded into a pilot um, in an adjacent community, a bigger community. Uh, and it's also the same approach that we'll be starting to, to do um, here in North East Victoria, which will, um, if people are interested, you can get in contact with myself. Um, it's in partnership with the Primary Care Partnerships to run a very similar sort of process of a community-based resilience network uh, in northeast Victoria. I want to come back just lastly to finish off to this to this symbol of kind of resilience that 
that um, one of the people there, it's actually the guy on the right there, Christian Munge, uh, who brought to this first session that we had together and he told the story. And, and this is for people, you, you might recognise it, it's a Fowler's um, preserving jar. And his parents had been um, impacted by the Warren Bungle fires. This was in 2013-14, I think, the summer of 2013-14, a, a, a relatively small fire in terms of area, but incredibly intense, and it happened very quickly, um, destroyed something like 56 houses and, and thousands of stock and properties damaged, etc. cetera. Um, Christian brought along this, this jar that he he recovered out of the rubble and the the, um, the damaged house, uh, you know, his parents' house had been destroyed. And he put it on the table and he just told this story about how his mother had been a, a, a famous um, fruit preserver in the district. She was, uh, you know, had hundreds of jars of fruit preserves and every single person that came to the house took away a jar of, of you know, some preserved fruit. And he told the story about how after the fires, obviously all of her preserving jars were destroyed in the fire and how afterwards they would come home and for many months after and people would, they'd come home and find just boxes of these preserving jars. And some of them were ones that people were giving back that they'd been given, but also some of them were ones that people had just seen at, you know, secondhand shops and op shops or whatever and bought these boxes and, and delivered them back to, to her. And it really struck me that, you know, this is such a simple thing, but that act of, of giving that she gave, but then she got, obviously they got it back in terms of the support that they got back from people. And this, this key idea of not just connection, community connection, but actually binding communities together. And this idea of reciprocity of, of giving and sharing and what that means and, and what that engenders in a community about that connection. And, that little jar became a really powerful symbol. Uh, Christian took it uh, down to Parliament House the day we got that award and, and was you know proudly uh, telling the story to people down there as well. And it's become a really powerful symbol. It's funny how something so uh, small and insignificant can be such an important symbol. Okay, so as I said, this has been a, a quick snapshot of a bunch of tools about working through um, this kind of process to help think about resilience in your place with, with your community, with your people, to think about going from planning to action. There's a number of little tools and, and processes that you can use to help explore that. And I'll put those links to all of those tools. Uh, and some of them have quite you know extensive kind of little notes that go with them. And I'll put all of those in a PDF that'll go out to you this week. Um, next week, we'll start to talk about in detail about the um, Golden Break and Catchment Management Authority's resilience work that they've been doing over a long period of time now. We'll talk about how they're using resilience as a, a, an underlying concept for the regional catchment strategy planning process. We'll talk about some of those opportunities for you to be involved, and there are lots of opportunities for you to be involved in that planning process and in community resilience work, and there's lots of opportunities um, that'll emerge, and we're hoping to talk about some of those next week, about what those ongoing opportunities are um, that people would like to see about building resilience and resilience capacity in the community. And so we'll be sending out a survey at the end of next week asking you for what types of um, actions or opportunities would you like to continue with in terms of building capacity and resilience thinking. Okay, so we're just about out of time. We've got a few minutes for questions. Um, again, as we have each week, I'm happy to hang around um, as we go past the 10.45 mark and Ash will be as well. So just wondering if there's any comments or questions. I can see one already from Helen McGowan. So Paul, can you talk about how you extend the invitation to people to participate? Is it open to all our people paid? Who funds the beer and chips? Good question, Helen. So. In, in the case of that community resilience network, um, most of those people were identified and, and were invited to participate. They also ran a community, um, a, an expression of interest process that was open to anyone in the community. The reality is not many people expressed interest because they didn't know what it was about and they didn't know what they were joining, getting themselves in for. So the majority of people in that network were people that were tapped on the shoulder. And um, there's no 
there's no fee or anything like that, but they did have to commit to giving up six days of time over the year, broken into three two-day sessions. That's that's quite a commitment for people. You know, these are all people running businesses and running farms and, um, you know, working in jo day jobs. And so they had to commit to that and, and the, that was um, absolutely um, rock solid. They had to commit to participate in the six full days. And, and I think almost everyone did, apart from some people that had, you know, personal issues or whatever to deal with um, at the last minute. And that was really important and it really built a strong network. The beer and chips, um, they fund it themselves. So it's, it's you know, they ask people to bring stuff along and share and apparently that has been working really well and there's, and, um, and there's like they get 50 or 60 people turning up to some of these and that's, that's a lot, but sometimes, you know, it might be less than that, but th there's a real desire for people to get together and so the willingness comes people will bring you know the the nibbles and drinks and all of that sort of stuff so that they don't have any trouble funding that sort of stuff the other work that the group does is funded by little bits and pieces of of money from local government from resilience new south wales the new government agency there uh, as well as um, little bits and pieces of money that that um, have come through you know little projects government projects and that sort of thing um, so another question from Lee Manning, do you think the new group starting out on their journey need to work through or list all of the persistent type things before they can move on to the creative transformation aspects? That's a really good question, Lee. I think, you know, that group in New South Wales, they, they were very conservative people in a, in, a, in a good way, a really positive way. They were very conservative about the sort of work they wanted to do. They didn't want to do anything that would upset anyone in their community. They didn't want to take the role of anyone else in the community or of the emergency services. So they were really deliberate about being very low key. And in some ways, I think that sort of fed into this idea of um, a, a sort of a, a kind of low key sort of approach fed into the idea of just persistence. I think it actually they were sort of, if you like, at the start, almost a bit cautious to, to do anything too radical. Over time, that shifted more and more. And I think the shipping container idea is a, is a kind of a, a symbol of that, of how they are starting to move towards these kind of bigger and bolder sort of things, uh, realising that they can do these sort of things themselves. So I'm not, I'm not convinced that you need to think more, you know, start with persistence before you can move to the transformation end necessarily. I think context is probably really important. And it could be that a community that's facing real issues in terms of, you know, a real crisis, for example, might just jump straight to that transformation end. They might be just very committed and there's, you know, work going on in small communities all throughout regional Australia where communities have sort of tried to go for pretty bold um, change and create bold change in their community because they recognise the challenge they've got. It, it might be, you know, youth unemployment or it might be um, retaining young people in their towns, those sort of things. You, you do need to be bold. And so actually just taking a kind of persistent sort of mindset to it, you know, is probably not the way to go. So I think the context probably matters. And I think the people around the table matter as well. And, and I've got the example of the opposite happening where we're um, some transformation work we were trying to do in a local government area in New South Wales where lots of people had bold ideas, lots of people wanted to create really significant change. This was a community that was really struggling in drought and um, with closure of some of the major food processing areas, um, organisations, that sort of thing. They were really struggling. They wanted to take bold action. But in fact, there was a power network of people in the community that didn't want that to happen. And they didn't participate in most of the processes. So we ran lots of community processes, very similar sort of stuff to what I've been talking about. They came in at the last minute and essentially shut down a lot of the innovation and a lot of the change that people were looking to do. And, you know, that's that's uh, was a powerful lesson for us. Essentially, we had the wrong people um, or not the wrong people. We had we didn't have the right mix of people involved in the process because um, those people had sat back, and and we should have engaged more with those to understand the real kind of underlying sort of power networks. And 
we talk about shadow networks and it sounds you know sinister but it's just these kind of background networks of power and sometimes um you know they can work against the process or or if they're not happy and if they're not engaged and so the context really matters understanding who the who really matters making sure you can try to get the mix of people around the table all of those things might determine the strategy and the balance between more conservative you know persistence type thinking and more transformative more radical kind of thinking in a sense okay any other questions comments that people have yeah just a comment from liz davis who is one of the people in that photo one of the great contributors and um the the network includes local land services staff in the group and the entire process and that's been really important so those um agency people have played an incredibly important role in helping to link that those that group and those people to their surrounding you know institutions and organizations and to provide some capacity and some resources at times to help that group through and all of those sorts of things so that link with the institutions and agencies has been really important and liz has been one of those people well done liz any other comments or questions from people well, thanks, so thanks. Paul, <laughs> Thanks, I don't know if we've got any more questions coming through there. Yeah. Um, we have recorded this again, so it'll be up on our website today, later today or tomorrow, if you want to share it with any of your networks or colleagues. Yeah, and as I said, Ash will put, make sure all of the links to those little tools and, and um, uh, got little guides to those tools and everything, I'll, I'll send those around with the PDF. So. And next week we'll be going through a similar sort of um, discussion around the Gone Broken's um, regional catchment strategy renewal process and sharing a few of the um, concepts that we've used and tools um, so far. Um, yeah, so it'd be a little bit similar to this week. Great. All right. All Thanks, right. everyone. I'll um, end this meeting now. So um, thanks and yeah, look forward to you all joining next week.